And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, a, a, a self-proclaimed artist and storyteller, and one who's author of a few, of a few comic books, now, de now delving into the weird and wonderful world of, desi of designing his own role-playing game in the form of Parapsol, the one and only Jeremy Landry, not to no. be confused with Laundry. How you doing today, man? Not too bad yourself. Yeah, I had I had to get the laundry joke out of my system because I'm pretty sure somebody oh, that's has okay. made. I'm pretty sure somebody's made that joke at least once. Not a problem. I I get it all the time. Yeah, I I figured as much. <laughs> oh. Well, thank you for having me on the show. It's a it's a pleasure to be on here uh, to be able to talk about uh, this game that uh, I'm designing. Mm -hmm. So. I like to start at the humble beginnings with this kind of thing. Absolutely. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Okay, well, uh, as many other designers or even game masters, I started off as a regular plain old player. I had one friend who got me out of the my basement and said, you gotta try this game with us, and it was actually uh, Dungeons & Dragons 3.5, you know, mm -hmm. the holy grail of Dungeons & Dragons, in, in my opinion. And he says, oh, you gotta play this game, and it, it was right up our alley. We loved RPG games, so naturally I started playing the game. And mm -hmm. as we're playing with the Dungeon Master and all that, obviously I'm... I'm my imagination is very wild, so coming up with creative ideas. And the one thing that I loved about the RPG games in Dungeons & Dragons was the role-playing aspect of it. However, what I found that was lacking in the 3.5 edition, or at least with my uh, Dungeon Master, was he just focused on the mechanics, or uh, rolling the dices. He didn't really focus on, you know, the role-playing aspect, the part of the game that I really enjoyed, which was creating this character, living in this this world, and you know, trying to uh, work things out. So as time goes on, you know, we try different games. We try. Um, then I get introduced to the game called uh, Vampire: The Masquerade from White Wolf, uh, and this is a heavily RP. Uh, oriented game so naturally I fell in love with this one but I wasn't too for the the, the vampires whole and I mean I still played played for a couple of years and then somebody said oh you know White Wolf has another game called Exalted now this is the game that I actually <laughs> fell in love with and Exalted was the game that uh, prompted the creation of Peripsal so it was a over the top uh, make exuberant actions create uh, you know your anime style characters and just you know be as OP as you can be and I love this aspect but you know there were some things that I liked about Dungeons and Dragons and I missed about it and I'm like how can I merge the two how can I have the simplicity of the d10 system with the RP system but still have the type of world that the Dungeons and Dragons gave and all the lore and all the story that Dungeons and Dragon had. So that's when I started creating this game. So of course, just like any other indie game, you start off with a couple of friends and you're like, hey, I've got an idea, I wanna try out something. So we started fiddling around with the uh, the core rules of Exalted and I created this world. And of course, at this time, I'm heavily into comic books. I'm drawing my own I'm getting a lot of creativity going, which was something that I've always been into. And so we, we created this world, me and uh, three of my friends, and we started this epic quest, which was, you know, 10 years in the making. And of course, as the game grew and became more and more its own thing, uh, of course, in every single um, parties, you always have 
the one that's trying to screw around the the game master. You know, how how can I make his life a living hell? And he would always play with the rules just enough to make him his characters uh, overpowered. And I'm like, well, it's not fun if you're already going to be overpowered right from the start. Let's. So I would redo the the rules and modify them and then eventually it just became its own thing i mean there was next to nothing that was white wolf involved in it there was nothing that was really dungeon and dragons and so that you know continued on and the story was amazing we everybody loved how the story was and you know that's basically how perp soul got created and it was a d10 system that was you know really really basic i wanted people to focus on the role playing rather than okay well I have to roll a d4 plus a d6 and I have to modify this with it and I'm like no no you roll how many points do you have in your your stats uh, okay that's how many dice you roll you got it okay good let's move on and so that's basically how the the, the origins of her um, soul started and a couple of years into it, I was trying to s figure out how can I make this even better? Because now that we have this whole system in place, but there's no level system. And of course, I'm still playing video games. And one of the main video games that I've been playing were, at that time was Final Fantasy VII. And the Final Fantasy had an, a unique little aspect called a limit break. So, you know, you get damage or you give damage and your little bar would go up and I'm like how can I add this to Peripsal so that's where we created the soul break system so it's the same type of um, system where you receive damage or you give damage during an encounter and you're eventually whoop you got superpowers and, and then whoop a summon and then whoop more powers and whoop another summon and of course that just got worked over over and over and over until it became where it is today mm -hmm. and then for a while uh, essentially when the, I uh, became a, a father myself and had to put all these wonderful projects on the back burner for a bit this as many new parents do when the, their babies are born and now that they're old enough you know I started to revisit and I had uh, some work colleagues that got me to DM some games and they're like, oh, this is interesting. And do you have any games? And, you know, brush off the dust off of the initial core book of Herpsal. Mm -hmm. And I get back into it. And now at this point, you know, there's all kinds of new technologies that are out that I didn't use to use. Discord, I never used that before. Uh, uh, Fantasy Ground and all that. So I'm like, oh, these are interesting. And how can I add this to the game and it just it, it flew off from there and then people got really involved into it and got interested and they're like oh you should make a book out of this and well you know uh and we got the pandemic so everybody is stuck at home and well with free time what do i do well let's brush out some old core books and let's uh, start working on them and that's basically where I'm up to at this point where Peripsal is now at the stage where it uh, it's becoming to a point where it's at the, the pay testing because it's it's one thing to play with friends and all that that know the core books since 10 years back but it's another thing to see okay how are how is it going to be received by the general public at this point and that's where I'm up to mm -hmm. now of all the of all the subgenres of fantasy that you could go with, what was the reason you went with steampunk? I just loved the style. It it was honestly just a a a style ish. I love the 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 greedy, but I love um, clockwork. And this is actually something that's personal as well. You know, uh, if you come to my house and I, I've got a bunch of old uh, pendulum clocks going about everywhere I re rebuilt my own clocks and it's just it's a love for clockwork and steam engines and you know the the airships and it, that goes way back to kind of uh, also the fa uh, Final Fantasy uh, 
uh, 12 and Final Fantasy 7 where they had these airships going about everywhere and and I just I love that whole look I love the the feel of it so that's where the, the medieval fantasy steampunk uh, genre came into play mm-hmm. and within now within that when I was going through when I was going through the playtest document that you had that you had sent me um, beforehand um, yeah. I was raising I was raising my eyebrow at a, at a few things because simply because I was getting uh, world of darkness um, flashbacks I didn't know that exa- that exalted was a big was a bigger influence um, based on the time on the time frame that you mentioned I'm guessing your introduction to exalted was second edition actually first edition oh yeah, I never played the second or third edition. I was introduced to first edition uh, Exalted, where they had uh, a lot of the OP uh, characters brought in. But it was it was definitely it was the introduction of the D10 system that uh, caught my eye, and that caught my love for that type of gaming. Mm-hmm. It was the the simplicity of. You just have the one dice to roll. Yep. Now, that being sa- now that being said, um, one part- one particular thing I was curious if this if this is something that you're going to be devel- going to be developing is when you look at a lot of the World of Darkness games, mm-hmm. yes. Whether whether it be what whether or just the storyteller games in general, um, there's usually some sort of extra element beyond um, attributes and sk- and um, skills. In something like Vampire the Masquerade, you have the you have the disciplines based on what your clan is. Yeah. Um, in Exalted, you have that you have the char- you have the charm trees. Exactly. And this what I'm curious actually... about it if, is if you have if if um epic skills is what what is what would be the equivalent in your system, or if you have something different in mind. It's actually a mix of two. Uh, the epics, uh, the epic skills um, sub mechanics is basically in the homebrew aspect of the game because it's going to be a heavily homebrewed uh, parts. Uh, just as I know for a fact that people aren't going to follow each rule to the letter. So what I'm trying to develop is more a um, guideline rules that, okay, well here's some some interesting rules that you guys can play with. Now create a world with it. Mm-hmm. Now definitely Peripso is going to have its own world. It's going to have its own uh, starter quest eventually. Uh, which is actually in development right now. We're trying to iron out a few of the details for it. But when it comes to the special abilities, special trees, well, that's where the Soul Break system comes into break. Uh, the Soul Break system is not something you're going to automatically get right off the bat. You have to build it up. And why it's what makes it unique is kind of like how Vampires has the trees and the. the, the Vampires don't. Uh, vampires don't have trees. It, they sorry, have the, the the families. Mm-hmm. The families. Uh, Exalted has the trees. Mm-hmm. So it's it's really in the sense that when you're going to be doing the soul break, it's a special ability that gets unlocked. So you don't actually have access to it right from the start of the beginning uh, of the of any quest. You have to build yourself up to a point where you get that power. And the power is, you know, unlocked via a, an encounter, and then it takes into account the virtues and the the values set that you have. So, I mean, if your character has gone a bit darker, well, the power is going to be a bit darker. The only thing you get to choose uh, as a player is whether or not it's going to be a, a an attack style, a defensive style, or a support style uh, limit break. Mm-hmm. And then after it's been used up or ha- it's been unlocked the first time, then you can reuse it as many times as you want to if you have the amount of uh, quote-unquote orbs that have that act as, you know, the um, 
the power source of these uh, these powers and the the the, the sorry summons. Yeah. Now, within a, within systems that have a limited resource, there's always the concern over um over no over the Nova problem. Um, that that being people ho people holding off on the on that kind of thing, or or in and and something like this something like this as I've seen in other in other limit break like effects, um, playing vi playing extremely playing extremely conservatively to a bit to build up that gauge. Yeah. Um, well, I could understand uh, on that front. That's why it, it had. Uh, evolved mm -hmm. in the beginning it used to be just when you receive damage so i'm like well what about you know support characters in the background that don't do anything well the minute they go into an attack or an encounter you you start an attack so whether you're helping with the damage uh or you know doing some type of spell or doing a, an attack that's long range and it hits as long as you've done some type of damage then your your gauge will start go start going up and it doesn't take that much to actually bring up the gauge uh it's just as the levels progress it takes more and more damage to be able to do to fill up those that gauge mm -hmm. now with the, with that with that in mind, I think the ne uh, the next question that that I'm cu that I'm curious about is essentially the magic question. Yes, because while I'm not expecting the massive swaths of spell list, I'm guessing that you do ha that you are going to be having some degree of a of a spell of a spell system. That utilizes that utilizes some of the um, some of the skill setups that you have. Yeah. Oh, the the way the spells work now, in many RPG games, the one thing that I never cared much about were spells, and of course, I had to add this into Parasol anyway. So I had to make see how can I make it that it's not automatic, but yet you can do whatever you want, and that's. Basically, the premise of Parisol is that you, if you want to create a spell that, you know, God forbid, anything you want to do, you I don't you want to have a spell that shoots uh, some type of laser beam out of your fingertip. You can go ahead. That's not a problem. That the the way the the game master is going to have to organize these spells for his players is. Any player can do whatever he wants. That's the premise. But there is still a um, uh, in, in French we say GPS, so the go bon sens. It's a common sense type of uh, system in the sense that, well, when you start riding a bicycle, you don't just get on the bike and woo, I can ride a bike. No, you tend to fall a few times. And you start with training wheels, and then whoop, you get better at it. You take off the training wheels. Whoop, you start falling again. You, so this, the magic system, the way it works, is you can create any spell as long as it's based on an element. So one of the four main elements in the game, which is you know, fire, earth, air, and water. So that becomes a level one basic spell. So let's say fireball, which is the the example I have in the core book. So you learn how to light up a fireball. Okay, well, what do I do with this fireball now that I have it? Well, you can either throw it, you can use it to start a fire, you can use it to, you know, let your imagination run wild. However, you don't just get it right off the bat. I mean, you have to practice at getting better at your spell. So, the spell costs, let's say, two Val, which is mana, uh, quote-unquote, for in the game, because, you know, we, we want to try and create some unique names for our our game here. So your character who's a human who has limited vowel and can't do it naturally. So he needs a some type of catalyst, so you know a magic staff with runes on it. So now he's got his his 
tool to be able to create a spell or to invoke a spell. He plays his two vowel and whoop, I'm able to create a spell. Mm -hmm. Okay, good for you. You've managed to successfully activate it and then you, you uh, let's say if you want to throw your fireball, well now you have to roll your dexterity and melee or dexterity and throw to be able to see, okay, do I touch or do I hit the target? So it's always a two part for the spells. Once you've done this about five times, if I remember correctly in the rule book, then it becomes an expert level spell. It's still a level one, but now you've mastered that level one spell. You're not just trying to invoke. So instead of costing two vowel, it costs one vowel and the difficulty rating is a lot lower. Mm -hmm. And now you've become good, you've become a master at a level one fireball spell. Okay, good. Now you wanna you wanna be able to, you know, split this ball into two fireballs or you wanna upgrade it. So now you put experience points into the into your character and whoop now it's a level two fireball spell. Well just like the training wheels you take off you got him good at riding a bike with training wheels. Now you take off the training wheels. What's going to happen? You're going to wobble and fall. Mm -hmm. So now it's a level two novice spell. So now you have to restart. You take five times at reactivating it, and it costs more magic to activate because now it's a level two. And then, whoop, I'm gotten really good at it. And this is basically how we are making sure that spells are uh, not automatically OP'd. And like somebody was uh, telling me, well, what stops me from just spending a whole session just uh, practicing making my spells all the whole session? I'm like, well, you can do that. But are you going to have enough magic to do it? Are you going to have enough magical essence in your character to be able to do it? Because once you've used up your magical essence, you have to replenish it. And by replenishing it, well, you have to either do something to build it up or you have to meditate for a few hours or, you know, so there's, there's some pretty strict limitations on how you can use it to avoid uh, it becoming overpowered right off the bat. Now, taking that, taking that into account, I'm guessing that e even with this heavy customizable approach to spells, that there's still going to be a short list of example spells so that it's not full choice paralysis. Absolutely, absolutely. And just as much as there's going to be, you know, a small list of basic spells, there's going to be a small list of intermediate spells and expert spells. And, you know, descriptions and, well, you know, to do an expert spell, you kind of need to have that basic spell. So let me take an, uh, an example. You want to make a wall of fire. Perfect. That's great. That's an intermediate spell. Well, to be able to do your wall of fire, you have to invoke fire first. So you have to invoke that fire, that level one fireball spell to be able to create that uh, that wall of fire. So everything will branch off in the sense, and it's just how the character either phrases his, his spell, how detailed he wants his spell to be, and that will be actually up to the game master at his discretion or her discretion to decide, okay, well, here are the limitations. Okay, this is a beautiful spell, but you need to be able to have this at level 2 to be able to activate it. Mm -hmm. So, it, it's always going to be to the discretion of the Game Master, and although this does make up for a bit more work for the Game Master, usually uh, uh, GMs who are doing um, these types of role-playing games, the, the storytelling, are already aware of the massive amount of more work that we have to do because we are creating a world, we are interacting with, with the NPCs uh, compared to a game master that will just play something like, uh, uh, well, okay, you want to do that uh, that action, roll me 3D6s and to see with your, your strength. Mm -hmm. So, this is something uh, having game master different types of games that I've noticed that you know story storytelling you're already starting off with okay it's a lot more work so somebody who's passionate about it 
won't bother it won't be bothering him or her all that much to think of a, a little bit more when it comes to the spell but there will be example spells in the core book to help out at least give a guideline yeah now when it comes when it comes to co when it comes to combat um, one of the one of the big things within uh, within the storyteller system is the fact that actions are based on more of a tick like approach which I've seen some people compare to the active time battle that you see in um, that you see in Final Fantasy or the variable turn setup that you saw in Final Fantasy 10 the latter of which is probably more accurate are you going with a similar approach of actions being tick based or are you going with a more standard um, action economy? It, the uh, action or encounters are all going to be much more... And I, I'm, I'm going to use other systems as examples just because it's easier for uh, listeners and it's easier for players to uh, understand this. At that point, it's the D&D type of combat system where, you know... A combat turn is the equivalent of between 30 seconds and a minute or 10 or 30 seconds within. So each person will do an action that is going to be a reaction from the last turn. Mm -hmm. So using an initiative uh, turn based system where you know you roll your initiative at the beginning of the combat uh, encounter and that same initiative is the same for the the rest of the of the whole encounter in which case it's not going to be well we re-roll initiative each turn no that's not going to happen all right i i can i can get that now in a lot of games there's usually some sort of extra effort um system um World of Darkness was no World of Darkness and Storyteller is no exception. It has the will it has uh, willpower. Um, yeah. Exalted had both willpower and your essence rating. Mm -hmm. Um what does Parapsol have in that regard? Well, it it does have a willpower esque type of thing. Uh it's actually called if I remember correctly, give me a second here, because just for that I have a brain fart. Oh, come on. It's not willpower because obviously I don't want to uh, infringe on any copyright, which is a big issue right now. It's we, we just call it resolve. It's your resolve. It's your character's resolve to wanting to accomplish this action. So uh, depending on the type of race that you start with, each race has a different resolve uh, baseline. Naturally, during character creation, you can... Uh, pay for more resolve using some extra points that you get uh, to iron out or flesh out the character and basically this resolve acts a lot like uh, the storytelling uh, systems where you can use it to grant automatic successes but you know you you pay one resolve for one automatic success just to make sure that you actually accomplish that action and you know to be able to regain your resolve or you have to go and do actions that are complementary to your character's uh, personality. Mm -hmm. um, so when, in other words a more forgiving take on, um, li on limit breaks and virtue flaws. Exactly. So it's not going to be as many of the flaws but there's still going to be um, the you know if you're playing somebody who's a, let's say a paladin so if you do something that coincide with what your character is or his personality trait well then he he'll, he'll gain a, a point of resolve back mm -hmm. which he then can use uh however his personality if you're going to play against it that's where the values come in i mean if you're again uh, let's take the, uh, the example of a paladin you're a paladin and you walk into a, a village and you see a a villager being harassed by some bandits and you do nothing and so I'll say well can you roll me your compassion cruelty 
And if they fail that roll, well, they gain one point in cruelty because they saw something happening and they didn't do anything, but that's against what their character is. So the character will do it anyways. I mean, they'll walk past. But now how did that affect the character's psyche? So that's what the values are. And the values afterwards are primarily used for the soul brick system. Mm -hmm. And now one thing one thing that I'm that I'm curious of, I'm curious about is you you did mention a re, you did mention a resource when it come when it came to magic. But you'll rec you'll recall that exalt that exalted put something like exalted put just as much effort in supernatural martial arts and I'm curious if if you have if you if you have anything if you have anything close to that or if some or something like that would be in the purview of soul break that could be in the preview of the soul break now the soul break system is very randomized in the sense that it's going to be it's there's not going to be that many examples in the book of what a soul break is uh, there will well there will be because i'm going to add those that uh, i had created during the, our 10 year initial game but it's really situational so when it comes to you know special abilities in that sense well that's most likely going to be the epic skills uh, which we discussed so uh, you know, somebody who's going to gain, let's say he does a, a triple backflip while swinging uh, his, his scythe and whoop, he manages to uh, skewer two, three enemies, then he jumps off the wall, which is doable in one turn. Oh, granted, there's going to be uh, quite a few uh, penalties for each sub uh, sub action that he's doing in that turn but if he manages to let's say pull off an epic success which is five successes and above well then it automatically becomes an epic skill so th that epic skill the character or the, the player will write it down in his character sheet he gives it a special name uh, you know the the, the 12 scythe of death and that becomes a new skill that he can then add points to it using experience points and it's going to act well okay I'm going to use my uh, my twirl scythe uh, backflip action oh okay it's your epic skill perfect so roll me your dexterity and your epic skill mm. and that's it so instead of having to reroll all those other uh, parts of that action like he did originally, he can just roll that one roll now instead. So it makes it easier for the character and encourages them to wanting to uh, play those extra dice, is wanting to do those uh, uh, amazing moves in the hopes of gaining these special types of abilities. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, in, with that in mind, when it comes to, given the fact that we've that we've done, that that um, you've made it very clear your fascination with steampunk, um, yep. and some and some of the other games that we've covered in this, I do have to ask: Will pl will players be able to access airships, and have and have you given consideration to ship combat? Absolutely. In fact, it's a uh... It's going to be a whole other subsystem in the core book. It's being written as we speak. It's still in its uh, infant stages, so to speak, of just ironing out the, the rules. Um, in the character sheet, if you have, take a look at it, there's a physical skill called Sail and Ride. Now, these are for the vehicles that's going to be in the game. So you can either have a one-man piloted airship or a fighter jet or whatever because you know the two society the two main factions in the game are one very high higher technology which is the more higher end uh, steampunk and then you have the lower technology and more magic and spell based but they still use airships so you can have somebody that's you know just 
flying around in his little scooter type airship or you can have the the whole crew type of uh mechanic where it's airship to airship combat mm. in which case uh each character will have to take a a post so you have one that's uh, uh manning the guns you have one that's the commander you have one that's uh uh you know repairing the damages to the to the actual airship and that's where you know social skills can come in handy let's say if you're playing the captain who's giving the orders well you have to be able to give you know some persuasion or diplomacy to be able to encourage the crew especially if you're playing a, a huge uh Tarosian battleship that has you know 200 crew members and on that that one airship and to be able to guide all these people to go okay well we have to work together now so airship to airship battle is definitely going to be a high aspect uh, without giving too much uh, of the, the, the punchline for the, the main story quest. There are higher technologies that come into the game in the storyline of the, the main quest that uh, just makes this whole airship feel even more grandiose. So definitely you can do that or you know during a, an airship encounter it might happen that whoop you're getting a you're being boarded well now it's not airship to airship anymore now it's, you're being boarded by the uh, enemy uh, combatants so now you have to go onto the deck of the ship and whoop you're in tight quarters in which case it turns back into a regular encounter style attacks but then you have to watch out that you're not destroying your own airship and Causing it to fall out of the sky. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, with that in mind, what are, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count for this? Uh, initially, we're looking at about two hundred and fifty pages. Now, this is you know with the examples. This is going to be you know item lists, uh, spare spell list we're trying to keep it um as compact as possible so like the 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 initial core book right now i have if i remember correctly has something like 165 pages but that's because i've started you know putting in uh that on to uh two you know two columns instead of one column uh, there's original artwork that's being designed by a very talented artist of ours who's making sure that we're not using any stock images. It's all custom-made uh, images for the game. So, you know, it, we're going for a feel that it's going to resemble that, you know, a little bit like a a player's handbook or the, uh, the core book from D&D. &D. You know, it's got artwork, it's got examples, it's got lists it's got graphs and uh all all these wonderful visual aids because uh, as a as a game master i do uh, recognize the necessity of having written aid and visual aids because sometimes a, an image is worth a thousand words mm -hmm. now with that in mind i, I know that you have have it that the Kickstarter's deadline is going is going to be um, August twenty third. Uh, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window, for at the very least a quick start version? Well, the the early the earliest we can try and get the quick start because the quick start ha is not going to have any of the world building material. It's just going to have the core uh, the core rules in it, and very dumbed down quote unquote um uh, versions of these rules because we still want to encourage people to buy the core book but we do understand that you know the the quick start guide will be more for the players and how to create and how to actually just start a game and we do actually have a core book in its uh initial phases it's actually has been play tested a couple of times so we're adjusting accordingly to the playtest that has been used mm -hmm. and 
so far we're getting a lot of good reviews so definitely the, the quick start guide will be released a lot earlier i'm hoping that without you know knocking on wood or shooting myself in the foot with this one by april we should have it out before at least a month to a month and a half before the core book is out and that's just because the core book we know we're going to glam it up a bit more than the uh, uh the quick start guide mm -hmm. well i i will be keeping an eye out for that kind of thing so and with that said i do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here that's not a problem actually i really enjoyed it and anytime you see fit to return to the temple the door is always open as i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged <laughs> sounds great and of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!